Hello, and thank you for joining this uh, talk, How to Beat Your Rheumatoid Arthritis. I'm Dr. Humaira Bacha, and I'm a consultant rheumatologist with 30 years of experience. I was trained first in India and then in the United States, and I've treated patients with rheumatoid arthritis across the globe, living in Los Angeles, then Singapore, Boston, and currently in Dubai, and treating patients in India as well. So I bring to you the experience of these years, not only using medication, but approaching patients with a holistic approach, including diet and exercise, helping you beat your rheumatoid arthritis. So here we have our slides, and um, I want to state that none of what I say is meant to replace medication and uh, evidence-based medicine. Um, everything we do is evidence-based, and you will be seeing that as we progress on our slides. First of all, before we know about rheumatoid arthritis, we wanna know what is arthritis? There are 200 joints in the body and there are more than 100 different types of arthritis. Most of these arthritis are autoimmune, such as rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and ankylosing spondylitis. We also have crystal deposition diseases such as gout, septic arthritis due to bacteria and infections, including chronic infections such as tuberculosis can also occur, and degenerative arthritis to, due to wear and tear in joints, such as in osteoarthritis, which mostly affects older people. But for today's talk, we're gonna focus on the most common autoimmune arthritis, which is rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic inflammatory condition affecting the joints. It occurs when the immune system mistakenly attacks the body's own tissues. And I'm just gonna to cut to this painting by 17th century painter Rubens. He himself suffered crippling arthritis. And you can see that in the painting uh, where the hands of the girl bearing the flower basket or the fruit basket are swollen at the joints and the knuckles and almost deformed. So if you study Rubens' paintings, you'll see that many of his paint subjects had such hands, which reflects the inflammation and swelling of rheumatoid arthritis. Usually seven in thousand people are affected or about 1% of the population or a little, a little less than 1% of the population. Two to three times more common in women and the average age is between 48 to 60 years old. However, rheumatoid arthritis can also occur in children and that's called juvenile arthritis. And often we see older people who get it for the first time in their lives as well. So what happens in rheumatoid arthritis? In the upper left-hand corner, you see a joint where there's cartilage and then there is um, you know, normal synovial fluid. The light blue is the cartilage. In rheumatoid arthritis, there is inflammation in the joints where there is swelling like this and it's thickening of the synovium or the lining of the joint. And if this swelling and inflammation persists, it starts chewing into the bone and erodes the bone and causes joint damage. Early rheumatoid arthritis usually affects the small joints of the fingers and toes. It tends to be symmetrical, but as the disease progresses, it can affect any joint, but also there's a lot of variability in how the disease does present, and that's why we need a rheumatologist for this diagnosis. It can also cause inflammation in other parts of the body, like blood vessels, that's called vasculitis, inflammation in different parts of the eye, including the sclera or the middle part, or even retina, Heart vessels can be, um, can be affected and rheumatoid arthritis uh, patients commonly have coronary artery disease and even can suffer heart attacks due to chronic inflammation of the blood vessels. And sometimes we see patients with interstitial lung disease, scarring, fibrosis, or even nodules in their lungs. The signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis is usually pain and stiffness in the morning. Usually the stiffness is more than half an hour, redness and warmth in the joints, and swelling, swelling of the joints indicates inflammation. Some patients may have dry eyes and dry mouth, fatigue or tiredness, mild feverish feeling, lumps or nodules under the skin, which are rheumatoid nodules, numbness or tingling in the arms or legs as a result of carpal tunnel syndrome and poor appetite. Rheumatoid arthritis is usually genetically driven. Even if no one in your family has rheumatoid arthritis, the gene does get passed on and something in the environment can trigger the onset of the arthritis. Usually in the environment, we have bacteria or viruses which trigger the process. And sometimes we have even recently seen COVID itself triggering the onset of rheumatoid arthritis, and I have several such patients. 
hormones play a part. Women are most commonly affected. And sometimes we see the disease getting better during pregnancy or much worse just after childbirth. And lifestyle, smoking cigarettes especially is a big risk for rheumatoid arthritis and obesity, especially in women. However, one of the things which is not mentioned on this slide is stress. I see chronic stress and acute stress being triggers of rheumatoid arthritis. And these are definitely correctable factors. Um, stress, smoking, weight loss can be corrected and controlled. Patients who have longstanding rheumatoid arthritis can be at uh, risk for osteoporosis, rheumatoid nodules, uh, dry, as a, dry as a dry mouth, and also because immunity is not working as well, can be more prone to infection risk and as a result of the disease itself or due to medications we use to control it. Some patients will get carpal tunnel syndrome, heart problems we mentioned already, lung, lung disease, and rarely, uh, rarely, very rarely, a blood cancer called lymphoma. So to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis, this is really not diagnosed based on a blood test. Rheumatoid arthritis should be diagnosed by a physical exam. The joints will be examined for swelling, redness, and warmth, and for range of motion. The doctor may look at your inflammation markers in your blood, such as ESR or CRP, a rheumatoid factor, and anti-CCP. So I have to mention that if patients have the typical clinical pictures of persistent swelling and inflammation in the joints, which is symmetrical, affecting the small joints, um, it can be diagnosed as rheumatoid arthritis, even if the blood test, rheumatoid factor, and CCP is negative. And sometimes patients have high rheumatoid factor and CCP and do not have swollen or inflamed joints. And in that case, they do not have rheumatoid arthritis. So there is zero negative rheumatoid arthritis where your serum can be negative for the rheumatoid factor. So if you have persistent swelling and inflammation in the joint, but your blood tests don't show it, you still could have rheumatoid arthritis and see a rheumatologist to have this diagnosed. X-rays are not so useful in the early stages for diagnosis but we do rely a lot on ultrasound examination because this can pick up uh, inflammation even in the early stages, erosions or bony damage, um, and all sorts of other issues can be diagnosed by ultrasound. So the goals of management are really to reduce pain, improve fitness physical function, decrease or stop further joint damage, and, um, and also to reach certain targets. Uh, we use anti-inflammatory drugs for pain control. Steroids are sometimes used in sparing, in sparing doses, not chronically, but acutely to, uh, to control flares or to use as a bridge therapy till your other medications work. But the most important thing is disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, which actually treat the underlying disease, are uh, working on the immune system and um, helping to reduce your need for painkillers and steroids. The treatment choice really depends on how severe the rheumatoid arthritis is and uh, what are the balance between the risks and benefits and the personal preference of the doctor and the patient. Now, this is the old way. About 30 years ago, when I was in medical school, I was taught that patients should be uh, treated this way with physiotherapy first, then anti-inflammatories, then a little bit of steroids and add on the disease-modifying drug later. But actually we now approach this by the inverted pyramid approach that as soon as a patient is diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, they have to be put on a disease modifying drug because this is the fastest and easiest way to control the disease, prevent it spreading and affecting more uh, joints and even affecting your internal organs, which we discussed, the lungs, heart, eyes, et cetera. So we have some key goals which we want to uh, achieve as remission or low disease activity. And the rheumatologist usually, uh, uh, you know, look at 28 joints on your body, uh, examine them for swelling and tenderness, look at pain scales, and add these to uh, inflammation markers such as ESR and CRP, and come up with scores like DAS28 uh, or CDI or SDI. And these scores will tell you whether you're in disease remission or in low disease activity. And based on that, the disease can be managed. Now, this is a famous painting by one of the most famous painters ever, Renoir. And he, uh, when he painted this, he was you know, cr crippled with rheumatoid arthritis. We hate to use the word crippled, but actually he was very limited um, in his activity. The paintbrush had to be wedged between his fingers and he had to be propped up in a wheelchair. At that time, aspirin was just being invented and he did not even have aspirin to control his pain. 
In the early years, they used willow bark um, and then aspirin was available from 1897. So you can imagine people like Rubens and, and uh, Renoir and other people who developed rheumatoid arthritis had so much um, pain and inflammation and not really good treatments. And we're really fortunate for all of the advances in medicine. In the early 1920s, um, you know, they, they developed gold salts to use and treat arthritic pain. And prior to that, actually, 1907 was the first time people started recognizing a difference between osteoarthritis, which is the degenerative or wear and tear arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. In 1941, rheumatoid uh, arthritis was, was recognized officially as a distinct disorder. And in 1949, people used steroids for the first time to treat arthritis and it was life-changing. Sorry. And uh, after that, in the 60s and 70s, became available painkillers such as brufen and endomethacin for pain. And in the 70s is when we started using disease-modifying drugs such as penicillamine and later methotrexate. But what's really revolutionized our rheumatoid arthritis is our understanding of cytokines. These are the inflammatory chemicals in the body which actually drive inflammation. And by being able to block these inflammatory chemicals, including TNF, in 1998, we developed the first biological drug uh, called Eternacept or Enbrel. And this has really changed the lives of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And subsequently, there've been many, many more biological drugs. You can see here, um, in the last 23 years, initially, uh, the uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, it, European Medical Association has approved all of these treatments for rheumatoid arthritis. On the upper left-hand corner, these are drugs which block the TNF receptor in the body. And these are called anti-TNF medications, including Remicade, Enbrel, Humira, Simsia, and Symphony. And these are injectable forms and are extremely effective. Lower, uh, lower um, in the middle, we see other biological injections such as rituximab, map thera, toslizumab, and sarilumab. Now, the newer class of drugs called JAK inhibitors are the lower right hand corner, including um, Zeljans, Olumian, Rinvoke, and Giselka. So, all of these are tablets, the JAK inhibitors, and uh, pretty much at this time, this is what we have available, but all of them are extremely effective though they are a bit expensive and we have to monitor for side effects. One more painting by a famous painter. This is a painting by uh, Raoul Dufy, who had very bad rheumatoid arthritis, but he was luckier than Rubens or Renoir. He was one of the first patients uh, treated with prednisolone in Boston in 1950. And this man here, this man here is Philip Hench. In 1949, he discovered steroids. And in 1950, he won the Nobel Prize for medicine. So many of our patients are so afraid of steroids and cortisone, they call it, and uh, they refuse to take them. But this is actually a Nobel Prize winning medication. It's a life-saving medication, and it has to be used in the right methods and right way. You cannot use steroids chronically because that leads to a lot of side effects, weight gain, high blood pressure, diabetes, osteoporosis. But when used in small doses for short periods of time, it's completely safe and has limited side effects. And many times when you have to save someone's life, we do use high doses of steroids um, and they are absolutely fine to use. So the main categories of treatments in the disease modifying drug category, these are the traditional or conventional disease modifying drugs, which we use commonly. And these are the first line. This is where we start. And methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, so leflunamide, and sulfasalazine are the main disease modifying drugs. These are usually tablets. Methotrexate can also be given in an injectable form. So, this is the reaction of my patient when I first prescribe methotrexate. They first run away from the clinic, then they Google, then they say, Oh my God, you're prescribing me uh, chemotherapy. And yes, methotrexate was initially developed as chemotherapy, but in large doses not in the doses which we use as 15 milligrams once a week to 20 milligrams once a week. This is not chemotherapy. For rheumatologists, this is our gold standard drug. This is the anchor drug. Every new drug has to be compared to methotrexate and proven to be as safe and as effective, at least as methotrexate. 
before the FDA or the EMA will approve the medication. It is even given to children. It's that safe and has been approved for use in children who have juvenile arthritis. It doesn't cause any life-threatening side effects. I've used it for 31 years. I've never had a patient who had a serious side effect from methotrexate. Methotrexate has to be taken correctly once a week, and it can be taken as tablet or injectable form. It does have some nuisance side effects such as nausea and sometimes hair loss. And these can be managed with discussion with your rheumatologist. Your blood tests need to be regularly monitored when you take methotrexate because it can cause irritation of the liver. Alcohol use should be limited when you use it. And if the methotrexate, um, you know, if your liver enzymes are going up on methotrexate, usually a doctor will stop or reduce the dose and repeat the liver test and it goes back to normal. There's very little likelihood of any liver damage or um, other things being uh, more prolonged. Now, besides methotrexate, you have Arava and, and sulfasalazine, and it's pretty similar where they have to be monitored regularly and they have different types of side effects. But let's talk about the biological DMARDs and the Janus kinase or JAK inhibitors. Now, again, the biological injections are injections. And this, again, the reaction of my patient when they prescribe biological medicines, they want to run away because they think of escalating treatment. I've gone from a tablet um, and to something really expensive and an injectable. So they think I'm escalating treatment, but actually the biological injections are extremely uh, effective. And we've had a, like a real revolution in treatment. The main side effect of biological medicines are infection risk. They are mild immunosuppressants. So prior to starting a biological medicine, we do screen patients. Uh, we check for tuberculosis, chest X-ray, hepatitis B and C. The side effects of most of the oral disease-modifying drugs, such as methotrexate, can be nausea, stomach upset, liver um, irritation, and infection risk. And with the biological demand, it is not the liver and the kidney don't get affected. There's no nausea. There is no uh, possibility of hair loss. But with, with both the biological injections and the JAK inhibitors, uh, we always monitor the immune system and, and screen people for infection risk. Before we start on them, we check for blood tests for a TB. Uh, this is a TB quantiferon or TB gold, it's called. We have a chest X-ray and check for hepatitis B and C. And then we frequently monitor blood tests regularly with patient, patients or any type of disease modifying drug. They do have side effects, so we do monitor closely. Some types of vaccinations may not be safe while on disease modifying drugs and should not be taken when pregnant or trying to get pregnant. Now the vaccinations which are okay and have been shown to be okay are the COVID vaccines. We have used them safely on our patients. And uh, usually some of the medications like methotrexate need to be stopped for a short period of time when taking these vaccines. The biological drugs do not need to be stopped but the JAK inhibitors have to be stopped. The 2019 guidelines against rheumatoid, uh, against, uh, uh, against, uh, uh, for rheumatology, guidelines on rheumatoid arthritis management our uh, uh, therapy with disease-modifying drugs should be started as soon as rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis is made. If there's no improvement in three months, we should switch to a different type of medication, either combination DMARDs or a biological or JAK inhibitor. And patients have to be monitored regularly. Now, physical therapy and occupational therapy can be very useful to help with stiffness, pain relief, and, in, and strengthening the joints. Surgery, we have to resort to sometimes when a patient has persistent swelling, maybe a tendon repair has to be done. And sometimes patients who have had persistent inflammation or joint damage will need a total joint replacement. Lifestyle management is extremely important, including weight loss and stress reduction. Now, I uh, wonder how many of you will recognize this person. Uh, she was world number one tennis player, and she did have rheumatoid arthritis and continued to play with rheumatoid arthritis. Her name is Caroline Wozniacki, and she is one of the examples of people who can live their life to the fullest with the right treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. So that's why we, en we emphasize the benefits of physical therapy. Do not really, um, you should not really uh, exercise when your joints are very swollen or painful, but uh, exercising regularly especially walking, swimming, and cycling, gentle stretching, and gentle yoga with breathing exercises 
and gentle weight training are what is recommended. Do uh, discuss your, your, uh, your regimen with your doctors and don't overdo your exercise and don't, uh, don't exercise when you have physical pain. Some more famous people. Here we see Lucille Ball on the right, lower right-hand corner. We see on the upper right-hand corner, uh, Kathleen Turner, uh, Tatum O'Neill, and Phil Mickelson, who was a golf player. All of them have rheumatoid arthritis and have come out publicly um, in support of patients with rheumatoid arthritis and to increase awareness of this because the earlier we treat, the better patients can do. Stress management, we, we told you that stress can trigger arthritis and also trigger flares. So you need to learn how to manage stress by regular exercise, doing restful things, doing meaningful things, having friends and a bigger social circle. Joint protection, do not lift very heavy things, conserve energy, uh, pay attention to your pain in different positions. So I'm gonna spend some time talking about a healthy diet. It has been recommended um, that patients follow a Mediterranean diet, but also I'm interested in diets for rheumatoid arthritis. I have several other videos. I'm going to go through some slides talking about foods to avoid and foods you can eat. There is a full uh, peer reviewed paper published. It is available uh, on Google for free. If you Google the role of diet in rheumatoid arthritis by Dr. Humaira Baksha, you can find my paper. The first food is gluten. Um, um, more and more people, and even the American College of uh, Rheumatology and the Arthritis Foundation of the United States is recognizing that gluten um, has a relationship in triggering rheumatoid arthritis symptoms and uh, should be avoided. The second food is sugar. Many sugar, uh, studies have shown that increased consumption of sugar leads to uh, increased risk of autoimmune diseases, uh, diabetes and metabolic syndrome. Third food is omega-6. Omega-6 is found in fried and fatty foods and vegetable oils such as sunflower, corn and canola oils and in meats such as chicken, pork and beef. Omega-3 is good for you, but the ratio of omega-6 to three should be under four is to one. To achieve this ratio, you should cons consume less of the fried and fatty foods, and more foods rich in omega-3. <clears throat> Sweetened beverages is definitely a no-no. Please avoid Coke, caffeine-free Coke, and even artificially sweetened uh, caffeinated drinks. Dairy products is very controversial because dairy is one of the main sources of calcium, but many studies have shown that eating dairy foods increase low-grade inflammation, and uh, also that dairy or milk cow's milk has a protein called casein, which can actually trigger a worsen uh, rheumatoid arthritis symptoms. Red meat increases the risk of rheumatoid arthritis. These are the studies on the right-hand side. And while these may be difficult to follow, you must decrease red meat consumption. I'm not advocating for a vegan diet, but definitely a plant-based diet where you add many plants to your diet and eat less of red meat. Processed foods such as biscuits, cookies, processed meats, packet snacks are very high in trans fats and increase inflammation. Added salt to the diet is associated with rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune disease. And there is hidden salts and ketchup pickles and other packaged foods. So what are the best foods for rheumatoid arthritis? When you're eating for rheumatoid arthritis, remember that you're eating to improve your gut microbiome. A healthy gut microbiome, it really supports a healthy immune system. And to support and have a healthy gut microbiome, you need fiber. A woman needs 25 grams of fiber a day and a man 30 grams. Some of the foods which are rich in fiber are mainly lentils and beans, especially black beans, red beans, and uh, brown rice, uh, uh, apples, bananas, quinoa, and um, potatoes with the skin on. Great prebiotic foods are listed here, including onion, garlic, apple, and banana, Cocoa and flax seed and oats are also great foods. Probiotics can sometimes be used to increase, improve your gut microbiome, although there have not been studies which show direct improvement in rheumatoid arthritis. If you do use probiotics, a dose of 50 billion should be used. Uh, need at least 10 different states, strains in your capsule. You need an acid resistant capsule and lactobacillus cassii, lactobacillus acidophilus should be present. Ginger is very effective as an anti-inflammatory doses, uh, anti-inflammatory um, uh, substance. 
Bus high doses can cause stomach irritation and gastritis. Turmeric, um, a concentrated curcumin, 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams per day has been used as an anti-inflammatory and studies show that it reduces pain and swelling in arthritis. Vitamin D deficiency definitely contributes to rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases. Make sure that your levels of vitamin D are about 30 nanogram. Primary source of uh, vitamin D activation is through sunlight, but it's hampered by sunscreen and pigment and sunscreen and, and, and big people with pigmented skin also have less absorption of, of the ultraviolet light. Omega-3 fatty acids, we already spoke about it. Sometimes it can be used as a supplement. It's present in, in fish, such as salmon and walnuts, as well, and also flaxseed. Fruits, grapes have resveterol, pineapples have bromelain, and tart cherries or cherry juice all decrease inflammation and should be eaten and added to your foods. Women who have consumed berries were less likely to have uh, inflammation. Uh, berries are rich in quercetin and rutin, uh, which are very beneficial for your health. Broccoli, which has sulforaphane, and spinach, which is high in the antioxidant chemferol, are extremely good source of calcium and very good for the gut microbiome as well. Olive oil has been something which has been shown to decrease inflammation and levels of inflammatory markers. Talking about oils, it's important to know about the smoking point and oxidative point. Cook with oils that are stable at high heat. Avoid vegetable oils and canola oils. Avoid cooking with fish oils and flax oils. Coconut oil is generally resistant to heat and is safe. And olive oil can also be cooked as can safflower oil. So we just talked about diet and I just wanted to mention activities of daily living besides exercise. Just keep active all day, walk, stress, uh, uh, walk, climb stairs, move around, try to do everything for yourself as much as you can. Women with rheumatoid arthritis can get pregnant, can safely get pregnant and have children and um, we support this all the time, uh, but it has to be planned. For instance, methotrexate has to be uh, stopped for at least three months prior to pregnancy planning and you should consult with your doctor as to what drugs would be safe and for you to switch, on to, switch off to. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my slides. Uh, I have a book, The Wellness Guide to Arthritis available on Amazon and do, do check out my other uh, talks on, and videos uh, for this.